So welcome. This is uh, one of my very first Facebook Lives. I'm super excited that you're here. Uh, had some technical snafus this morning, so I hope everything is all set up now. So today we are discussing Maria Schell's book, Improv Patchwork. Um, and I'm trying to make sure that I can see all the comments, which I can. So hello, Lynn, who says she's from here from New Mexico. Nice to see you. Um, but I'm wondering how many people have actually read this or are interested in it. Maria Schell is a quilter who lives in Alaska, and I've always wanted to take a class with her. I'm hoping to make it to one of her Zoom classes that she's been offering. Um, she does beautiful modern quilts, and I actually found out about her when I went to study with Nancy Crow, who's a very famous um, quilter who she also studied with and who she mentions in the book. So as you can see, I've got lots and lots of tabs in my book. This is a library book. Um, so <laughs> as you can see, it's a library book. So I was unable, obviously, to write in my book. I actually do like to write in my book. So Nancy, I see that you say that you bought it and you started reading it. Well, I thought what I could do today is point out a couple things that I thought were interesting, some takeaways. Um, if you guys have opinions or thoughts, you know, I'm really hoping that this monthly book club will be really a discussion and not just like a lecture from me, but that there'll be lots of give and take and input and it's totally okay to say you hate something or you disagree with it. I think that's an important part of the process, okay? So I'm going to switch my camera so that you can see. It's gonna be upside down for a second, but I will turn it around. Let me just see if I can't do this. Here we go. I'm sure you're enjoying the palm of my hand. Okay, so let me flip this right around so that you can see it in the correct orientation. Um, and, oh, good cat, finished reading it. And other people I say, uh, okay, so check it out and let me know. The video is hanging. Is it, can you see now? Is it still okay? Let me know in the comments if you see it. It looks like it's okay to me. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, take a look. So the sort of, uh, one of the things that I really liked about what she said is she has a lot of um, encouragement in here. And I wrote on this just here about being fearless. And I'm just gonna read this, uh, what she says here, which is she says, um, by, I certainly hope the techniques in this book will encourage you to create original patchwork designs. I also hope you will see this not only as a quilting book about how to make prints out of solids, but as a book about being fearless. Not every print you build will be a success, but sometimes the only way to get to the successful prints is by making a few duds along the way. Oh my gosh, if I could highlight that sentence. By embracing this process that includes failure, poor decisions, and mistakes, as well as successes, you will come to your own design aesthetic. I think this is such a huge key to success. Failure is immediately important. Okay, thanks for letting me know that the video is okay, and I hear some people refreshed, and it was fine, which is great. So I think that's important. Um, I also like that throughout the book, there are all kinds of tips. Like, these are tips on being a fearless quilt maker, but I don't think it's just about quilting. I think they apply to any kind of... Um, any kind of art making. So, uh, you know, a quitter rarely succeeds and a finisher almost always ends up with something, right? So that's what they say. As long as you start doing it, you're ahead of anybody else. Practice is an essential part of the quilt making process. Let me know in the comments if you're actually a quilter or if you're a mixed media artist or what kind of art you make. Cause I'd love to talk about that too because I don't think you have to be a quilter to get a lot out of this book. Um, one of the things I like here that she says is she says, empower yourself to do the best work you can by using only quality tools, supplies, and materials. Life is too short to work with inadequate tools and materials. How many of us have made do with a really bad pair of scissors or a not great sewing machine or the not nice paints because, oh, I'm just a beginner, I'm just practicing. No, no, life is too short. It is really important, I think I agree with her here about really doing working with good materials. I think they're worth the investment. So um, I thought this was an interesting discussion about space. Look how beautiful her studio is. Let's see if I can get this nice and close. She has this huge studio with a big long arm machine. But the thing I like is that she says, you don't need to have all this space. But the reason that you have to have space um, is because you know, you need to be able to know that you can make work when you want to make work. And she says her first room was approximately six by 10. It was the laundry room. 
and her design wall to the back wall and it worked right. And I have to say, I agree with this. Even if you just have a closet, it makes a big difference. Now, the part that I think applies across many disciplines, if I may, is the idea that color is relative and that what she does really well is she uses value. And I thought we could talk just a little bit about that and I could show you some examples that I think are helpful. Um, here she talks about using colors you don't necessarily like, but I thought this would be kind of interesting. So this is a grayscale and value finder. It's one of the best art tools that you can invest in. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to sort of visually look and try to figure out what the value is of anything. Because more than color, value makes a difference in terms of how we see patterns. One of the things that Maria Shell suggests in the book is a red viewfinder. If you look through a red viewfinder, you can see colors um, as values just a little bit more clearly, right? You can see what's dark and what's light. And I think it's pretty clear. Let's see if I can hold both the book and the viewfinder up at the same time. Um, you know, why that pattern in the blue and white works so well is because of the strong value contrast. Now, one of the things that she says that I agree with is that these red things don't always help you with the color red. Um, and another thing is if you don't wanna buy a tool, if you have a phone, um, you can use your phone and switch to mono or black and white, okay? And you can also then, let's see if I can hold this up to the camera. Whoop, there you go. And you should be able to then get the value and to see it really clearly again, which I think is really helpful into figuring out how you're gonna make your design pop. So even though these designs look a little bit sort of chaotic at first glance, they're actually very clear because of the value differences. So I think that's really helpful for me. Um, I see, I love seeing what everybody's saying about what they make. There's lots of quilters and mixed media artists and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, Kelly, or Kate rather, Kate Kelly, I totally agree with you. She says her writing is clear and concise, which I appreciate. And I think that that's important. So it's really easy. I wanted to also show you another tip which is you can create your own kind of, I'm gonna put my brayer in here as a bookmark. Um, you can create your own little value scale. So this is just some scrap papers that I had and I arranged them in order of value. So from lightest value all the way around to darkest value. And this helps me then when I'm building a palette or when I'm trying to figure out, you know, how to create, make a pattern show up, I can just go ahead and look and see do you know what I mean? How to get that contrast. It's not actually color contrast, it's value contrast. So for instance, the pink and the red are actually not that high of color contrast, right? Pink is a form of red, but value wise, they're quite different. Even these greens, do you know what I mean? Have a value difference. And I think that's what's important. And if you don't believe me, let's just turn on the grayscale thing on the phone one more time. And we'll take a peek. Okay, so here's my tag, and here it is in the grayscale. And you can see the difference in things is much clearer. And even if you can't sort of see it at first, what happens when you create compositions, I think, is that your eye sort of naturally sees those value differences. So I hope that helps. Um, Kat's asking, where on your phone do you find the mono? I don't know how to do it on Android and um, on the i on this iPhone, and I think different iPhones are different. There's like a little button up here when you're in a photo that shows it to you. Um, I think on some of the newer iPhones, there's like a swipe up thing for it, but you're just looking for that. You could probably Google the model of your phone to look for where you can find that. Um, so a strong personal color identity, that's what I wrote here on this um, post-it. And I just wanted to talk about this as an idea and I'm wondering if any of you have done this. By the way, Tama describes herself as an imaginer and I love that. I totally wanna to steal that, that's such a great idea. A great description. So she says, um, try not only to observe color but also articulate to yourself what you are seeing. Identify how you want to use color. I call this creating your own personal color identity. 
Do you like muted palettes or are you a graphic quilt maker using bold colors? Do you gravitate towards cheerful color palettes or are you more somber? Knowing this will help guide you in building palettes. While selecting your palette, try very hard to shut off any analytical or critical voices in your head. Try to work only with your eyes and emotions. How does that color palette feel? Does it create the feeling you want to evoke? Practice, practice, practice. Developing a strong personal color identity takes time. It is as much a part of your voice as a quilt maker as the compositional and technical choices you make in your work. So the reason that I love this is because I think we sometimes are like, oh, I want to, you know what I mean? I don't want to like use the same colors over and over, but I think that's fine. She's saying that you can have a personal color identity. You could be a person who created for years just using blues and whites and do all kinds of interesting work. I think this goes back to embracing who you are, which I think is always an exciting and good idea. Um, the next thing that I marked in here is tips on being fearless with color. Who here struggles with colors? Or anybody who struggles with kind of like finding the colors or um, choosing colors, or we all feel like we're really color confident. I feel like sometimes I'm color confident and sometimes I just rely a little too much on super high contrast to make things look good. Um, but what I like that she says is she says, predictable is boring. Challenge yourself to be unpredictable. So what would being unpredictable in color mean? Well, it might mean that like if you were going to choose to go with maybe like warm tones, you would throw in something unpredictable in that color palette of warm tones. Maybe you would throw in a purple you know, or something a little bit off or odd, or maybe instead of always doing your warms as yellows and pinks, you might throw in a brown, which would still keep you in that sort of warm range. I mean, I feel like there are some kind of fun things in there that you could try to do. Um, I love this tip. She says, look in nature and in urban environments for color combinations that excite you. Take photos so you can recreate that palette with fabric. This is something I do in my sketchbook all the time is I take a photo and I extract a color palette from that photo. Um, and then this is a great tip too. Think about why you like a particular color combination. Try to put it in words. I'm a huge believer that if you can't articulate something, you can't fix it. So I really think that being able to say why you like it is really important. I see all the people who are chiming in to say that they have the struggle with the color and I feel you. It's not always easy. It's not always easy. Um, and then there's just a bunch of other tips about color, but I love this last tip the most, which he says, just because you haven't seen it before doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Yeah, let your freak flag fly. You do not have to be like everybody. And I think that's important too. Okay, let's get on in here. Um, so here we are. She's talking about extracting the color, and this was a great example of it. Let's see if you can see that. So she's taken the, I don't know my flowers well. Is it a pansy? Is it a posy? Okay, it's a flower. It's a red flower. I don't know what kind it is. Um, and it's, uh, you can see that she's taken the color palette and not only the palette, but she's taken the amounts of the colors, right? There's a lot more red, a little bit of white, a little bit of that kind of purpley color, and then just a touch of pink. Um, and certainly she's decided to omit the green, which I think is fair, but how interesting to take your color palette from that. And then here you can see she's working with that palette. Now a poppy would be a great guess, Rachel. I totally agree with that. Um, and Claire has a great tip, which is we were talking about using the red viewfinder, which is hard to use on fabric that on reds. Cause actually, if you look through this red viewfinder here, the red looks odd, doesn't it? The red looks out of place, even though we know from the grayscale finder that it was fine. So she's saying that a green finder works on red fabric to establish value, which is great. Um, there is, I don't know if there's an app for pulling a palette from a photo, uh, which Nadia asked about, but I do know that you can do it um, online if you just type in pull a palette from a photo and they will pull it for you. Um, and here you can see, right, this is now her poppy quilt, even though it doesn't look like a poppy. And I love that, that you can find inspiration, but you don't have to um, do it as a copy. Now, this is so interesting to me. So I'm a fan of wonky, and I think this is a good example of it. So these stripes were cut using a ruler, and these stripes were cut without a ruler. I personally like this. Other people may personally 
like this. And then what I like is there isn't a right or a wrong. It's really about understanding your personal taste, which is always going to be important. I will say that I had a little fun after I read this book in my art journal. <laughs> And I just went to town sort of playing around with wonky stripes and sort of playing around with some of the ideas without actually piecing fabric, just sort of, you know, what can I do with stripes? How many sort of doodle variations can I do? And this is another way that I take a lot of quilting books or books that are about using supplies I don't have and figure out how can I take the design ideas, the color concepts and all that kind of stuff from it. And so this is kind of one way to do it, which is really fun. Um, one of the things I did discover is I did not do a good job with value. So if you take a peek through here, you'll see my value choices are kind of terrible. Um, and part of that is because I was painting, so I was mixing colors and everything kind of got smushed together. Whereas if you look at how, again, Maria Shell is using value, she is getting beautiful strong lines and contrast this looks good you know what i mean without any of that and in fact if you look at some of her finished quilts which may seem like they're made of many 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 colors let me get towards some of these things that may look like they're kind of chaotic again i know i'm hitting value hard but that's one of the huge takeaways for me from this book is how important and vital value is when you want to use all the colors <laughs> value can be a great way to organize things and really help the eye um okay she has lots of great tips about sewing and so like here's another great example i love this quilt it is just everything about it makes me happy and at first it seems chaotic but i sat down and i studied it for a moment okay so let's talk about this at first it seems like you think okay every color is used here it's super chaotic what's happening but then I started to realize, no, this, 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 and this, right? They all match. This is this reversed, you know, and this coordinates. So actually there's a complete and clear color scheme going on in each section and several of those color schemes repeat. So it's not chaotic. It actually was carefully planned and thought out. Even if you look how like this is um, cold colors inside, this is warm colors outside. This is cold colors outside, warm colors inside, you know, and so they actually do work together. It's just, I thought this was a brilliant, masterful use of color and making it appear to be chaotic when it's actually very orderly. And again, the, even with value change, it still reads very, very clearly, which I think was really, really cool. So, um, Rachel says uh, that it, her, the, the concept reminds her of Chick, Chuck Close, who makes a lot of sort of large images from small pieces. Um, and Bev says, can you talk more about how you see value? Is it contrast or intuitive? It's hard for you to see. So I think Bev, if you came in late, I was talking that there are a lot of different ways to see value. Um, it's really about practicing over and over and over again. You can use some cheats like your phone to kind of see value. You can use a red viewfinder to find it. You can train yourself with a grayscale value and finder. It is how the value goes from lightest to darkest just like that in that you, and you can kind of figure out, you know, what everything is. And generally speaking, in a piece of art, you wanna have things that are, some are dark, some are light, and some are in the middle. You don't wanna have, if you have every value and kind of you can get that blendy look that um, Ellen's talking about that she likes sometimes about blendy blendy. Um, but if you have jumps, that's when you get high contrast, which you're talking about, right? Okay. Oh, Bev, you were here the whole time. Okay, well, I hope that clears it up for you. Uh, okay, so how gorgeous, how gorgeous is this quilt? I love it, and I love that it's called Light Bright. I had a Light Bright when I was a kid. I loved it. I don't know if they make it anymore. I think I would be afraid that my son would swallow the pieces. Um, but you can see just absolutely beautiful and so simple in some ways, right? You can see that this is essentially strips of color, and they're just bordered with black. How neat is that? But again, beautiful use of, can I say it again? Can I say it one more time? Maybe you guys will take away the same thing from this book that I did. Beautiful use of value shifts 
so that it's still interesting. Okay, um, and then where's my next post-it? I love, this is like, this is actually the cover photo, so I'm not alone in loving it. Um, but it's another just example of how she is using color in what looks like such a insane way with tons and tons of every color. And yet actually it's a well thought out, well put out. Imagine it without these brown stripes, right? Totally different quilt. And that's why sometimes we have to use the colors we're not naturally attracted to, I think, because they make the other colors pop. Um, some other things I liked from the book. Um, I loved seeing her process. So uh, this is an, some examples of sketches that she's made of trying to think about how to work something out. And then this to me is genius. So I don't know if you know what a nine patch is. So if you're a quilter, I'm sure that you do. If you're not, you may not. But essentially a nine patch is kind of what it sounds like. It's, hmm, that china marker is in very bad shape. Um, it's nine pieces. Now, normally, you know, when people get fancy with a nine patch, it's doing something like putting another nine patch in the nine patch, right? But what she's doing, which is amazing, is these are all nine patches. They're just uneven nine patches. I'm going to say that again. And if you ha don't have this book and you haven't seen it, just take a peek again. These are all nine patches. So for example, when you kind of look at how this is pieced, you realize that what is the, what is the nine patch design, for instance, of what looks like a cross? Well, it's that, that's one, two, three. Then this is one, two, three then this is one, two, three. So in fact, it is a nine patch, even though at first glance, it doesn't seem like it. And you can see, you know, another example here and another example here of that same idea. And I think this kind of creativity, I mean, this is a nine patch. This is a nine patch where things just aren't necessarily even. How cool is that? So if I were to sketch out that design, you know, it's like this maybe, like this, you know, you can see that there's a thing here and how would you put it together? And now there's a thing here, but that's not part of the nine patch. Then there's comes down, then this little part, then this kind of, you know what I mean? It's a weird and interesting nine patch in which there are internal sort of lines that fool your eye. And this made me think again, from, even for people who aren't quilters, when you are thinking about putting something together, whatever it is, can you just take a very basic, simple design? You know, let's say I'm going to take, I'm going to use this design, the idea of a third, right? This is one of the most common designs that we use is that we divide off a third. How many different ways can you play with this simple idea, the simple line? Could you do a hundred pieces of small art based on one single design. And I think you would come out with something amazing at the end because it's based on a really good standard design that stood for many years and yet it has your creativity in it. So I hope that that helps. Um, and then she has a lot of conversations about piecing, which if you're a quilter, I think is really interesting in terms of like how you put it together and how you think about it. Uh, I think this book's just really great. And then one of my favorite parts of any book, and I think people sort of glance past and off and close, is the resources. When people tell you the books that they like and you respect their work and think you're there talented, check these out. These are often great places. Along with websites or supplies or anything like that, I think all of that is really, really helpful. I would say overall, I really, really, really liked this book. Um, and often I test out library books to see if I want to take them home. And I think that this is probably one that I'm going to take home. I wonder if um, any of you feel the same way. Hello. Uh, do you feel like this is a book you have to have that you're going to use, that you're going to do a lot of things from? Or do you feel like... This is a book that it's like, it's fine that you saw it, but maybe not necessarily for you. I definitely think as much as, as obviously I own all these value tools already, so I know how important value is, but it was just really hit home for me in playing with this one. So I think that's the big lesson 
that I am going to take away from there. Um, I also did pull out, because I did a bunch of these little scraps, I have all these papers here and I thought we could talk a little bit about putting together a palette too, if that's interesting. So let me know if that's something that you're um, interested in playing with. Uh, I think that it's a little bit harder with paint than with fabric because you can't mix, you know, sort of the paper colors or rather you, you end up mixing the paint colors. And so that gets a little bit tougher because you get things that are in the middle instead of having like a clean, clear palette. Uh, so Rachel says, I feel like it would stretch my quilting. I love the bold colors and imperfect lines. Me too, Rachel. I think that, um, she's so, she's just so out there. Like her quilts feel wild and yet controlled. It's something that's really lovely because they're clearly like almost a gridded. Um, Kate Kelly says, great first pick. I've purchased it and appreciate that I can use it across mediums. Yes, me too. I think that's really important. Uh, Claire says that you should look at Nancy Crow books too. Uh, Maria was one of her students. Yeah, I've taken a class with Nancy. I have, I spent two weeks at the Crow Barn and I actually have a signed copy of, uh, a, actually I think I have two different books by Nancy. I think she's really talented and great. Um, Kat says, my library didn't have it and I'm glad I went ahead and bought it. I learned so much about color and the variety of simple patterns too. Yes, totally agree with that. I think I tend to want to do more than is necessary. So I tend to like just more, 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 more. And I feel like this book for me was kind of a palate cleanser in the sense that it made me think about what can you do with simplicity? What can you do with just some very simple graphic ideas? And I love that. I, I would not say that her work is my work in any way, but I admire it so much. And I feel like I'm trying to figure out all the different lessons that I can take away from her. Um, and Bev says, I would also love to hear more about quilt patterns inspiring you in your artwork, also about your quilting. I didn't know you were a quilter. Oh yeah, I've got, I've got two UFOs up on my quilt wall right now and I've got a drawer full of them as well. What I would say is I like to make quilt tops. I don't like to do the quilting. It's too hard to manage the fabric and like, la la la. I mean, I think it's the, it's the reason long arm machines were invented, right? It's just so much easier to deal with them when they're not like rolled up in your little domestic machine. So I got to figure that part of it out. Um, Lori says, I bought it on your recommendation and I'm not a quilter and I love it. That's great. Oh, Bev, I just realized this. Another example actually of quilting's influence on my work, besides the fact that I never finish a quilt, I have my art journal here. So I thought I this is actually a really easy way to mention it is like, this is the beginning of a page for me, right? I'm at the sort of beginning stages of figuring out what's going to go here, but this kind of is a quilt. It's blocks. It's as if this were pieces of fabric that are patterns. And I think I do that a lot um, in my work is I think sort of of how think random things can come together to create something greater. And in the end, I think that's what a quilt is, is it's that, you know, you take this little triangle and that little triangle and suddenly you have a star. And so I think I do play with that idea a lot. So that's kind of interesting to me. Um, Nancy says, I wonder if she, I think assume you're talking about Maria, does any quilts with curved lines? You know, her Instagram is great and she shares a lot of work. And I'm trying to think if I've seen any quilted designs on her Instagram. I was just trying to pull it up on the phone here um, to show it to you. Her Instagram, by the way, I must maybe make sure I get this right before I give it to you wrong. I follow her is um, Tales of a Stitcher. So let's see if I can't find anything in here. Tales of a Stitcher. Um, and she does again teach Zoom classes. So I'm looking through her feed, see if you can see that, to see and uh, does this count as curves? Let's see, I think my ring light is reflecting off the phone screen. There you go. That might count as curves kind of. Um, and Lynn says, yes, she does. So, oh yeah, this definitely counts as curves. This is very cool. Oops, there you go. So lots of interesting stuff there too. Um, Walk is a great book for straight line quilting. That's a great tip. 
Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Take a look at her Instagram. She does lots of tons of cool stuff. Um, so Rachel says, as a quilter, it's interesting to see the use of solids versus fabrics with patterns out. Yeah, I started noticing. I mean, I think the modern quilt movement has definitely pushed that. Nancy Crow has obviously pushed that. When I went to the Crow Barn, you have to buy so much fabric. I think I literally, like the quilt store couldn't believe how much I was buying because you have to have like a full pallet of fabric. I still, I'm not sure I'll ever in my lifetime make it through the amount of fabric I bought. Um, but it's like it all has to be solids because I think what Nancy's interested in in a lot of ways is sort of painting with fabric. And I think what Maria has taken on, which is super exciting, is the idea of making your own pattern fabric. So in the book, um, which we didn't totally go over, she talks a little bit about um, working with pattern fabrics and how she actually fell in love with fabric, with pattern fabric before she found quilting. And sort of with crazy pattern fabric, like upholstery fabric and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, wait, there is a quilt in here that's one of her first quilts that has some pattern fabric in it. Let's see if I can find it. Here you go. Um, these are actually two quilts she made, one from 2006 and one from 2009. Am I in the camera? That is the question. This way. There we go. And you can see that there are some pattern fabrics there. So she has used pattern, but I also will say like, it's interesting how much cleaner the work looks when it is um, not patterned. Also, I don't know if anybody else loves this, but do you see how these points don't match, the, these points don't <laughs> match at all? I love that. I think it makes the quilt so much more interesting and more dynamic than if they all perfectly fully lined up which is really cool. Um, so Claire says she spent a week with Nancy Crow in 2000. She's still using some of the fabric needed for that class. Yeah, it's serious. I have um, two like underbed storage zipper containers just filled with um, solids, especially because uh, you once I got there, Nancy basically told me there was like a third of my fabric that she was like, you can't use these colors. Um, and th it's because she uses a very strict five value scale. So see how this has 10 values, say, values? She uses a very strict five value scale. And if you have a fabric that's in one of like, that's not one of the five values that she wants you to use, you can't use it. You just have to use those five values, which is really interesting to do. I mean, the, the thing that's good about it is you don't end up with kind of soft, smushy, gentle, you know, gradations, which, you know, may, if, if you, that's what you want, then you're in trouble. Um, the thing that's tough about it is if you're used to using things um, in kind of a gentler way, the five step really separates things out and limits the kind of colors you can use. I will say that Nancy Crow, the experience I had with her for two weeks is definitely one of the more sort of difficult art experiences, but I can feel how much I've grown since that. And I think I've definitely taken a lot of those lessons away. And Maria Shell actually got a scholarship. She got a grant, I think it says, to study with Nancy Crow. That's how much she wanted to go. And I think she went for, she went for quite some time, maybe four weeks or something. Um, and I know that that was a huge important part. So I, I mean, I do think people talk about Nancy Crow all the time and it's partially because a teacher who pushes you out of your comfort zone and has a very strong methodology can really be life changing in good and bad ways. So I think that's kind of fun to know. So any other thoughts you guys about the book, things that you liked, things that you hated, things that you didn't understand, anything else you wanted to discuss. I have one last um, kind of thought about it, which let me see if I can find the picture that goes with the thought because that will obviously be helpful. Here you go. Okay, this is a drawing of how the quilt is sort of meant to look. This is the actual quilt. And I love that they're not the same. And I love that this isn't square. And I love that it wasn't like this was the absolute, you know, saying like, just because this is the drawing that it had to look exactly like this. It's a starting place and then it goes where it goes. And I think that that's really exciting and it's a really good reminder. And it's kind of the methodology that I feel like is in this book. 
is the idea that, you know, you be you, find what's you, be diligent, work hard, do the things you need to, learn to get better, but like don't get stuck up in perfectionism and having it be sort of just a certain way, okay? Um, well, I hope you enjoyed our very first uh, book cl club meeting. If you have suggestions for other books you'd like to see or categories of books, do let me know. I'm hoping that once a month we can kind of get together, talk about uh, what you know, whatever the book is, explore any ideas from it and all that kind of stuff. I think that would be, I think that's gonna be really fun. So Bev says, I do appreciate inspiration coupled with practical knowledge as an artist. Um, it's always easy to let self-criticism mute you. I appreciate uh, you, she, and you called attention to keep taking steps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that um, I run into, I've said this before on my blog many times, which is the best thing that you can do to get better at art is to get over yourself, is to stop letting your inner critic sort of attack you and get in your head. It's not actually learning a skill. It's not actually learning how to paint realistically. It's not actually learning composition. It's just getting out of the way of yourself because no matter how many skills you gain, you'll never be happy with it if you can't get rid of that inner critic. So I think that's really, really important. Um, will this be recorded? Uh, I think that Facebook saves this. If I didn't set it up correctly, then this was it. But in the future, as I get better at these Facebook Lives, I hope I will make sure that that happens. So I think it's recorded, but I'm not 100% on that. Um, so I think I will just say thank you so much. Um, check out Maria Shell's Instagram. I think she posts a lot of great stuff. And thank you for being here. Thank you for all your comments. After all, Book Club only works when you have something to say. So I really appreciate that. Thanks so much, you guys, and have a great day.